All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, this is just a really, really great honor for us to partner with the Lewy Body Dementia Association so that we can provide you with this special showing of the film Spark. Uh, this is a really endearing and important story of Robin Williams and his battle with Lewy Body Dementia as told by uh, his wife, Susan. And so uh, we just really welcome you all. We thank you for your time uh, coming to this webinar today and just really excited to not only share the film with you, but share with you some information about Lewy body dementia, if you're not familiar with it, what it is. And at the end, we'll have a really special discussion with uh, a really wonderful gentleman who is living with Lewy body dementia and my colleague, Julia Wood. So on this next slide here, I'll give you a minute to advance. Uh, here's a picture of Julia Wood. Julia is very special to us. Uh, she has her feet in two worlds. She's an occupational therapist and one of the LSVT Big Training and Certification Faculty for LSVT Global. And her full-time role is Director of Professional and Community Education for the Lewy Body Dementia Association. And if you are part of that organization, you may already know Julia, and we're just really thankful and delighted to have her here today, um, have her help to make this possible in terms of this collaboration and showing. And also, we're just really grateful for Dr. Gary Schmidt and um, his willingness to jump on and share his own personal experiences. He's a physician and also a, a volunteer for the Lewy Body Dementia Association. So delighted to have both of you on our panel today. In the next couple of slides, I won't read through the bios of Julia or Dr. Schmidt, but they are here for your information. And if you're a therapist that is... Um, joining us. These are here for your reference in case you want to um, turn this in for CEU information. In terms of our disclosures, um, we have both financial and non-financial relationships, including a preference for LSVT loud and LSVT big as treatment techniques. Uh, Julia and I both do. And Julia is a consultant for LSVT Global and I am an employee of LSVT Global and we, we receive lecture honorarium. Just a few short logistics for those of you who are new to Zoom or new to our webinars, we ask kindly that you please keep your microphones muted. There are quite a few people in our audience and it will help us all to attend if there's no background noise from the various environments. We would encourage you to type in your comments or questions in the chat, especially during the film. Um, it's a really, really powerful film and I think it enhances it. If you just share your comments about it, um, if the chat is distracting to you, please feel free to you know, not open it um, and, and just enjoy the experience. At the end, we will have a short Q&A time where you can ask Julia questions or ask questions of, of Dr. Schmidt as well. So please feel free to utilize that chat function. A, a handout should have been emailed to you. Um, so please check your email. However, later on in the webinar, I will drop it into the chat. And once you click on it, you'll be able to download it to your own device. I uh, will also email it to you after the webinar in case you didn't receive it the first time. Um, after the webinar, probably tomorrow, we'll also email you a survey. We would love for you to answer this very short five-minute survey because it gives us information on um, how you like the webinar, what we maybe could do better, and if you have ideas for future webinar topics, that would be really valuable to you. It's a great way to share your requests and share your information with us. On the next slide, you'll see a few um, logistics in terms of CE activity. If you are a therapist joining us today and want to use this to self-report CE activity, you are welcome to. This is a 90-minute webinar, and to report it, you must attend for the full 90 minutes. 
please note this is not pre-approved for CE activity um, through ASHO or through various states or professional organizations. But if your state allows for CE report, feel free to email webinars at lsbtglobal.com after the webinar to request a certificate that you can use to turn in for a self-report. And lastly, just a few learning objectives on this last slide. Julia is getting back here right now, going the right direction. There we go. Uh, just real briefly, this won't be an in-depth presentation of Lewy body dementia, really some highlights, but we hope that by the end, you'll be able to differentiate two types of dementia um, LBD and really differentiate those. Uh, we also expect that you'll be able to identify the signs and symptoms of Lewy body dementia and understand the impact of those symptoms on functional independence. And because Julia and I are therapists and that is really our heart and soul and passion, we would love to share with you how speech, physical and occupational therapy can really provide a very tailored client-centered treatment to help people living with Lewy body dementia and their support systems. And with that, I'm now going to turn the camera and the microphone over to Julia for a quick presentation. Thanks so much, Laura. And when slides revolt, we were talking about before we came on of how technology this week, Zoom, there have been some updates on things and definitely my slideshow is going a little bonkers. So almost afraid to advance. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so thank you, Laura, for the introduction. And thank you all so much for joining. Um, as Laura said, my name is Julia Wood. I'm the Director of Professional and Community Education at the Louis Body Dementia Association. And something for you to know is that October is Louis Body Dementia Awareness Month. So I really want to thank my, um, my colleagues here at LSVT Global. I really call them my family most of the time for the opportunity to offer the film Spark and share information about Louis Body Dementia with the community. I also want to thank Laura Gouzet and Elizabeth Peterson for coordinating this event. That takes a lot of effort and they've done such an amazing job. Also, I want to thank Dr. Gary Schmidt for sharing his experience and expertise today. I think that will really um, enrich the conversation a lot and hopefully provide useful information for everyone. Um, we cannot ever show this film without thanking um, Acadia Pharmaceuticals for the support of the production of the film. And then last but certainly never least, um, a gracious thank you to Susan Schneider Williams for being so kind and sharing her story with us all to help our learning. So what I'd like to do to get started is, is kind of frame the conversation today, because a lot of people don't know much about Lewy body dementia. Um, and so to start with that, we need to first understand what the term dementia means, um, because it's kind of used um, in synonym with Alzheimer's disease. So often when you say dementia, people automatically think of Alzheimer's disease, but that's actually not quite accurate. It's a much bigger picture than that. So you'll notice here on this little spectrum that we show, of course, with, with aging, uh, we all have um, changes to our cognitive function that can include changes to attention or memory or word finding. When those changes are more than are what's expected for aging, but you're still living your life fully independent day to day, we consider that to be a mild cognitive impairment, or sometimes you'll see that listed as MCI. When we use the term dementia, what it means is that the changes to cognitive function are significant enough that they impact daily function and the level of independence for the individual. So that's really all it means. And there's some statistics here that I think are really important to keep in mind. We often say Lewy body dementia is the most, um, the most common form of dementia you've never heard of. And you'll notice here it's the most often misdiagnosed form of dementia. Um, it is the second most common cause of progressive dementias after Alzheimer's disease. And it's estimated that there are 1.4 million people living in the United States who are affected with the condition, mostly adults over the age of 50 but we are seeing people younger than that being diagnosed. Um, and studies indicate that it's the most expensive form of dementia due to the complex nature of the symptoms, issues with hospitalization, and falls and injuries. 
So you'll notice here, dementia really is an umbrella term, if we go back to that. Um, and it, it can encompass a wide range of symptoms, and it also covers a variety of types of conditions. So there you'll notice Alzheimer's, um, um, it covers about 50 to 75% of diagnosis. Um, vascular dementia is next to that, but that's not a progressive form of dementia. So then you'll notice Lewy body falls in there at that 10 to 25% range of conditions. So these are kind of, when we talk about dementia, it's a very vague term um, that I think covers a lot of different symptoms and different presentations. So what exactly is Lewy body dementia? Well, as I mentioned, it's a progressive brain disorder and it features these abnormal protein deposits that if you're familiar with Parkinson's disease, you've probably heard of called Lewy bodies. And those are just named after the neurologist who found them, Dr. Friedrich Lewy. And so you'll notice here under our Lewy body dementia umbrella, it's a very common theme, this umbrella in dementia, we have two types of dementia underneath. So Parkinson's disease dementia or PDD, and dementia with Lewy bodies or DLB. The difference in which one of these conditions someone is diagnosed with is based upon a criteria in which the symptoms, the timing in which the symptoms present themselves. So this is what that looks like. This is that one year rule. On the left hand side in that darker purple, you'll notice we have Parkinson's disease, dementia or PDD. So if you're someone who has had Parkinson's for a while, um, you've had an established diagnosis and symptoms. And then over time, we know for approximately 50 to 80% of individuals that they can start to develop symptoms of dementia that's considered Parkinson's disease dementia. So in PDD, the Parkinson's comes first. In the case of dementia with Lewy bodies, the development of de dementia or those cognitive changes is at the same time as the movement changes or prior to. So the dementia or the cognitive changes come first. So that can be a way to keep the difference in mind. So how do the two differ? Well, with Parkinson's disease, we know there's always an impact to movement. It is technically a movement disorder. Um, and we know that people can have mild changes in thinking, even at diagnosis with Parkinson's disease. And then later on, they may go on to develop dementia. In the case of dementia with Lewy bodies, there's always an impact on cognition. And then they will have one or several other Lewy body dementia symptoms at diagnosis. And this is something really important to note. They may not show obvious signs of Parkinsonism. When we say that, we just mean slowness, stiffness, shakiness, or tremor in the early stages. And sometimes people don't have very much Parkinsonism at all. So if you're wondering how they diagnose this, you'll notice here that someone must have that cognitive incline, decline to impair daily activities, plus two of the features here in the boxes. So I already defined Parkinsonism, those motor changes to slowness and stiffness in movement. Also, visual hallucinations are very common where people will see a well-formed vision of a person or an animal. Uh, we often see REM behavioral sleep disorder in which someone can violently or physically act out their dreams, and this can occur even decades before the onset of other symptoms. And then a hallmark of dementia with Lewy bodies are what we call cognitive fluctuations, where there are these changes and variances in the level of alertness or arousal. Someone might seem zoned out at times or more kind of on and with it at other times. But you'll notice the confusing part here is all of these symptoms can also occur in Parkinson's disease. So you start to see why this can be so difficult to diagnose. So let's paint the picture a little more clear. In receiving a diagnosis, and these statistics from what I can tell still are really holding, even though this was from, is a little bit of an older article, 66% um, of people require at least three physicians to obtain an accurate diagnosis. And half of the diagnosis take 12 to 18 months. So we're having to see a lot of different physicians and it can take a long time. 62% um, of those diagnosing physicians are neurologists, and so we definitely recommend that people consider if you're having signs or symptoms to try to see a neurologist, because unfortunately less than 10% are diagnosed by their primary care providers. And then you'll note here too, you know, a majority, almost 80% are diagnosed with something else first, typically Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease.
So here we note a lot of the clinical features and I think that, you know, the film today is going to really highlight and show some of these through Robin Williams story. Um, they definitely talk about his issues with sleep early on and how impactful those were. People can have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. Um, cognitive changes, I mentioned those fluctuations. Also difficulty with attention, um, sometimes word retrieval. They talk about Robin having some difficulty in his work and in the films he was working on. Um, the neuropsychiatric symptoms can present as hallucinations, as those visions we talked about, or delusions, and, and that's talked about in the film, sometimes fixed or false beliefs about a person or about a relationship. A lot of times they're paranoid um, in nature, so, so feeling distrustful maybe of people that you love and trust. Um, the motor symptoms we talked a little bit about, there can be changes to blood pressure in which someone can have fainting episodes or feel like their blood pressure drops suddenly when they change positions. And as you can imagine, this is very challenging for care partners because those cognitive fluctuations are very unpredictable. They make life challenging for both the individual with Louie and their family and loved ones. And of course, the symptoms impact so much more than their cognition. So we see increased risk for falls, challenges with mobility, difficulty with walking. Um, those blood pressure issues can be really scary and dangerous. And then the sleep schedules, of course, what impacts your partner impacts you as well. So no one in the house is getting much sleep a lot of times. Um, the behavioral symptoms start early on. And I think as a culture, we recognize that we're not really the best sometimes at, at being supportive, I think, and symptomatic and understanding when people have changes to their behavior and their mental health. And then we know, too, that activities of daily living for individuals with dementia with Lewy bodies may need support earlier, even than individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So how do we treat this? Well, the ultimate goal is just to improve and maintain quality of life. Um, many of the symptoms can be managed or reduced with proper medications and other types of therapy. So it's important to get in a good center of care and have a good care team on staff for you. Um, but unfortunately, there are no treatments that currently stop the disease progression or cure the disease. And I just wanted to put this in here, you know, unfortunately, what we see with therapy is that an exclusion for participation in a lot of research studies is if you have dementia. So we do not have a lot of research at this time. We do have some on people with LBD and, um, and access to therapy services. But Melissa Armstrong here wrote this article just a couple years ago that really talks about um, advances in care. And she wanted to highlight this, that there are no formal studies evaluating this, but we can really see the need for physical, occupational, and speech therapy to address swallowing evaluations, help with mobility, address fall risk and fall prevention, identify resources to help families, and also assist in function, and even address swallowing difficulties. So if you think about how complex the symptom presentation is, there's a lot of room for various team members to get involved and help maintain that quality of life. So it truly takes a village. You know, I've kind of talked through the therapies and, and what they can do, um, but we know social work often is really needed to provide resources and support. Counseling services are really necessary for the family in coping and, and getting those strategies in place. And depending on symptoms, you may need sleep specialists or urologists or different types of medical providers to really help you get the best care. So at the Louis Body Dementia Association, our mission is that through outreach and events like this, education with um, activities like SPARC and, and other tabling and events, and also our promotion of research, we work to support those who are affected by Louis Body Dementia. You can always visit our website at www.lbda.org. It's important to note if you are looking for excellent care, you can look to our research centers of excellence. Unfortunately, you notice there's a big gap there in the middle of the United States that we need to work on, um, like so many things. Um, but these centers really work to drive advanced clinical trials and provide the best support for patients and families. You can also check our website too. We're working on a Louis trial tracker. So if you are interested in getting involved in research and being an advocate, we'll have some options to support you in that. 
Our support services is a great resource to remember. Put it on speed dial. We have our 1-800 number there. We also have our support at lbda.org. And those contacts are staffed by an amazing um, licensed social worker to answer your questions and provide support as needed. Um, we also have Facebook and uh, virtual and community support groups that for people living with Louie, for care partners. Um, so you can really find the level of engagement and support that you need. We have a lot of publications. I may pop some of these into the chat today for download if you'd like. You can always reach out to us and we can mail you copies as well. And with that, I just want to remind you that after the film, we're going to have a discussion with Dr. Gary Schmidt about his experience with LSVT Big and how he lives well with LBD. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Welcome back, everyone. That's a little bit of a heavy um, load to unpack, I know. Um, such a beloved, beloved figure. Um, I love the quote at the end where he said, I want to help people be less afraid. Um, and I have somebody with me for discussion today that I know is working really hard at that in our community as well, um, Dr. Gary Schmidt. Here we are. Hi, Dr. Schmidt, how are you? Good afternoon, I'm good, how are you? Doing well, <clears throat> doing well. That's a heavy, heavy film. You know, every time I w I've watched it several times and it never fails to move me. The first couple times, I had tears throughout the whole thing, not because I was sad, because just the realization that what he had is what I have. And it, it really, it just confirmed to me that this, this is, this is true. This is real. And it's so complex. Absolutely. And I think having that, um, validation has to be really important, especially for something that's so not understood and not known about as Lewy body dementia. Yeah, well, that, that's what she said, is if you had early diagnosis, uh, it made all the difference in the world because he felt he was going crazy. He thought he was going insane because of what he's experiencing. But if you had known he had this disease, he could have tried uh, to figure out how to live with it. Uh, there, there was one quote in there that really hit me that I hadn't heard before. It's one of his friends at the end who said, uh, uh, he's going through all these changes, but I realize now there's nothing that we could do. But that's not true. You know, there, there's so much that can be done uh, from the time of diagnosis until, until you die, whatever that is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what our conversation is going to be about today. And just for the audience, just so you understand, um, my previous life <laughs> prior to these two roles um, was as a clinician for, at a center of excellence. And I worked solely with Parkinson's disease and related dementias and movement disorders. And so we will be talking about um, LSVT Big and LSVT Loud today. Please understand those aren't the only treatment modalities. And I, I'm going to encourage Dr. Schmidt too to um, talk about other things that he uses to live well. Um, but the whole point of this is really to help you understand different tools that are out there and resources that are available. Because just like you said, and that was, it's, I'm so glad you brought that up. There is so much that can be done. And, you know, many moons ago, we were talking about this last night in the clinician um, a meeting that um, they thought with Parkinson's the same thing. You should just go home and sit in a chair and try not to fall. And so we know so much more now. And I think that unfortunately, Louis Body Dementia dementia is behind the curve with Parkinson's disease and really understanding and having research on what we can be what can be done but I do think that you have such great examples and we can borrow from the Parkinson's research of course to understand so do you mind to start by just telling a little bit of how long you've been living with Lewy body dementia and how you got the diagnosis for sure um, I've been living with symptoms for probably about 13 years because my first symptoms, my first symptom, I should say, is the disrupted REM sleep uh, that they talked about. Uh, I actually hit my wife in the face twice and I fell out of bed. Uh, we don't sleep any longer together because I disrupt her sleep. Uh, so 
that happened 13 years. And then there was a space of time uh, where I, I controlled that with medication. Uh, then we noticed that I was having more difficulty speaking. My, my speech was quieter than usual. Uh, I was uh, forgetting places. We'd go out to eat and I couldn't remember where we ate. I could tell you where we were, where, how to get there. I could tell you the menu. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't tell you the name, forgetting names of people. Um, getting mixed up in conversations, uh, going out with a group of people and not being able to pick up on the conversations to the point where I had my hearing tested and the audiologist said, well, why don't you try a hearing aid? See if increasing the volume would help. Well, it didn't. A year later, I retested and my hearing was fine. It was just that I missed the word, the first couple of words. If there's distracting noises around me, uh, I lose it. Uh, but what really triggered it is you know, finding the diagnosis was uh, we were moving and I got very anxious in trying to take care of the financial part of it. I was able to do it, never got anxious about it before, had difficulty doing tasks like hanging pictures, which I didn't have before. Uh, and that was about three years ago. And I had the uh, <clears throat> You know, psych testing done, which showed that I had the mild cognitive impairment, which they talked about there, or which you talked about it. And it's, uh, it, they told me that because I had the disrupted REM sleep, uh, I was probably going to, it, it was a possibility that I would get Lewy body. Uh, and that hit me hard because as a physician, I worked in a nursing home for, for over 30 years and saw the end stage of, uh, of Lewy bodies. And I didn't want to become that grumpy old man uh, that sometimes I am now. Uh, and it really hit me hard. Uh, if we had known this is just something that came to me in the last couple of weeks. If we had known uh, at that time, 13 years ago, that disrupted REM sleep could lead to Lewy bodies, there are things that I probably would have done differently. And one of the things that I could have done differently is I could have changed my diet. There's more and more studies now showing that the, the high animal fat diets uh, leads it can lead to more tendencies toward uh, dementias and Lewy bodies. And then going uh, a, a vegan diet, Mediterranean diet uh, will slow down or prevent that formation. Uh, so an increase in my exercise and uh, there's other things that we could have done, uh, but the, the need to get that early diagnosis so that you can start doing those changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so um, I believe you did LSVT big and loud, you said a couple of years ago. So tell me how that came yes. into the picture for you. Was it the doctor that recommended it or you sought it out? How did that happen? Well, I was, there's a neurologist that I was that I had seen a couple of times and he had a sign in his office that says something about LSVT. And after I saw him the first time, uh, I looked up what that is. And I came back to him. It was a year later, obviously, and unfortunately. Uh, I came back to him and I had my list of 18 different symptoms, which he wasn't certain to what to do with those. Uh, but I asked him about the LSVT. I said, is that a good program? And he says, absolutely. And I said, is that for me? And he sort of hesitated. And I said, wouldn't it be better to start that while I can still walk than rather to wait until I can't walk? And he said, I guess so. Uh, so we decided to do the big and the loud uh, together, which is an intense program. It's, that was two hours, a day, four day, two hours a day, four days a week. Uh, and if you did the right thing, you did it during the weekend, which <clears throat> so 
some doctors say do as I do, not do as I say, not as I do. I'm one of those, unfortunately. So, uh, <laughs> so it sounds like you had a hard time following through with your home exercise it, it, program. Ex ex exactly. Yes. Okay, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's something a lot of times I think that's very normal, right? You know, there's different ways sure. that, that you can collaborate um, and have a buddy system. I know we were talking to you beforehand about some of the group exercise. And I think you said now you have a trainer that helps you incorporate it into your exercises now. Yeah. There, you know, I, I, I went a year without doing anything or I, I, I exercise. I went, I would go to the Y and walk and uh, ride the bicycles, uh, treadmills, the various aerobic exercises, which I know, which is uh, is probably the most important thing you can do for any type of dementia. Um, but I thought that maybe you could do, do more. So I started looking in our area, which is in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, and there's the LSVT program. Uh, there's the rock steady boxing, which is for Parkinson's. Uh, there was a park, there's a Parkinson training program at the YMCA on the, on the far side of town. All those would require me to get a ride to there, uh, which would make my wife have to drive me there or hire an Uber, which gets expensive. Uh, and so I talked to one of the trainers at the local at the YMC that I can drive to. It's only a mile a mile or two away, and asked her about that. And she said, "Well, we don't have the program here, but let me look into it." And she, she did, and she came back, and we've been we've been working uh, with doing some of the the, the LSVT big activities uh, and and other things. So I. I had to be my own research person, had to be, uh, you have to um, fend for yourself. Uh, Absolutely. But she's, your but own she's, advocate. But she's done looking. <laughs> That, that's the word I was think, looking for. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's excellent. Because, you know, that's so my disease. That's, that's, that's my your title. I forgot the word. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, too, it's so true, because I think that often, you know, uh, um, people look for someone to just give them the ideal, like, what's the ideal thing I should go and do? But a lot of it, you have to advocate for yourself as far as what's going to work for you, where to get it, how to get it. Um, and keep in mind, too, that, you know, your doctor should always be a resource or maybe your doctor's nurse or coordinator. Um, if you have done the OSVT Big and Loud programs and you want a virtual option, that's something you can reach out to us about. Um, and and then Dr. Schmidt, I just wanted to see too, what benefits did you see from doing LSVT big and loud? Kind of what did you feel like you gained from the program? I learned that I didn't swing my arms enough when I walked. <laughs> and I was yeah. surprised myself that when I did swing my, when I consciously swing my arms, my balance is better, yes. uh, my gait is faster. Uh, and, and so that was one thing, uh, but it did help my balance uh, probably more than anything. Uh, it's still a problem, uh, and some of the exercises that we're doing now uh, is for that. Uh, and I'll use a walking stick uh, when I when I walk distances. Probably don't use it enough. Uh, it gives me a little more confidence, so that I'm not feeling uncomfortable walking. I think it helps by my my gait as well, uh, as far as speed. Excellent, excellent. And that's the thing. For those of you that aren't familiar with LSVT Big, what we work on and big and loud is driving amplitude. So we know that with both Parkinson's and with Lewy body dementias, the movements get smaller. And with that, of course, when we move smaller, we move slower. So we don't drive people or tell people to move faster, but in moving bigger with swinging the arms, having that bigger posture, taking bigger steps, um, people do move faster. Um, and so just one last question for you. Do you have advice? advice? Sounding like you're telling people that you have to be their own advocate. Any other advice that you would tell people on how to live their best life with Lewy body dementia? You know, I, I think you have to be your own advocate, but don't get uh, frightened off by the fact that this is a uh, end stage disease. Uh, which it, which it is, but we don't know what end stage it, where the end stage is. 
Uh, there are people who live 15, 20 years with this disease. And there's a lot of living to do. Uh, and yes, you need to, to get your uh, affairs straightened out, but we should all do that. Yes. By, with that, I mean, we need to make sure your wills are taken care of, your powers of attorney are taken care of, that your family and everyone knows what's going on and what you want to do. Uh, but those are all something you should do before you even get the diagnosis, but make sure you do it afterwards. Um, then find something to do that you want to do that make, gives you a purpose for a reason to get up in the morning. Uh, and doing things like this is right now is my purpose uh, because I think it's really necessary that people, uh, professionals, society, know that there's something called Lewy by dementia that that does incorporate a multitude of symptoms. Uh, I added like five more symptoms uh, during the film to my list. I'm now up to about 35 symptoms, uh, but I have physical symptoms, not to mention the cognitive things. Um, but those are annoyances more than anything. Uh, and I think by group, by, by attending groups like this, uh, groups with people that have the same disease that you do, you see that they are leading productive lives as well. And you can talk with them. Um, so we get rid of that stigma of that and, and get rid of that word dementia uh, because it scares so many people. I like cognitive impairment better, but. Absolutely. That's something we're working on. And I know that's a big project um, at LBDA and then with some other um, individuals in the community is, is working on a nomenclature initiative to try to change the naming a little bit and be more clear with it too. Because right now I think a big problem is once you say um, dementia, people think Alzheimer's. And then I remember as a clinician, I often had trouble explaining to people, you know, how it was different. So, you know, the visuospatial impairments, my gentleman got into a pizza truck instead of a taxi cab you know luckily the gentleman <laughs> took him home um you know he had some judgment issues and executive function issues he didn't have memory issues they're like well he he knows every all his friends he recognizes everyone he's fine and so i think sometimes it's really hard for people to understand because the naming is so you know nebulous and not really clear i think the other thing you need to do is let people know around you what's going on uh, so that they understand when you don't remember their name, uh, that you can still talk to them. Uh, I've, I've got, this is a story I've told many times that when we moved into our house two years ago, uh, I've gone around to my neighbors and introduced myself and said, I'll never remember who you are. So next time I meet you, introduce yourself again. I'm not there yet. I may get lost sometime in the future. And if I look like I don't know where I go, point me, point, uh, me to the right, in the right direction. And I had one neighbor look at me, she says, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> and she paused and she paused and she said, I'm gonna tell you you came down to mow my lawn. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, we, we, we joke about that, but you gotta make light of it too. And you have to have, you know, you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna do things, silly things. Uh, if you can't laugh at yourself, um, it's hard. Well, well said, very good advice. And I note that someone has a question here in the chat for you, if it's okay. So they sure. ask what type of cognitive treatments or strategies do you use that you find useful? Oh. Um, for the cognitive part of it, I think you have to use your brain. Uh, try to find something that stimulates it, whether it's reading. Uh, I, I know someone who has a, a reading club uh, <laughs> that, that I'm not going to attend tonight. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's so important. If you can't read, use, uh, use audio books. Uh, word puzzles, uh, jigsaw puzzles. Uh, if you like writing, write poetry, write books. 
uh, race, write your story. You know, if you're if you're a good writer, write what's going on with you. Uh, find something that stimulates stimulates your brain. Find friends to talk to. Find people to talk to. Uh, have conversations. Sometimes I do that too much. I think. Well, at least I'm told I do that too much. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when you tell your story to the waiter at uh, the restaurant, uh, that may be too much. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it, it, you have to do that. Um, uh, I found I started working on, on my stamp collection and it helps, which I've set aside for 20 years. And not only does it stimulate my brain by using the computer, uh, by using my hands to move little pieces around, uh, to think about where this is, uh, the, remembering the history, which the stamp is from, uh, it, it's all, all beneficial. Do something different, do something new. Uh, Absolutely. As much as I like to just sit in the chair and do nothing, uh, I have to force myself to do things. Absolutely. So well said. And, you know, I think as an occupational therapist, for those of you that aren't really familiar, because sometimes people think we just help people get jobs, that can be part of it, but that's not all of it. We really work to help people stay engaged in what's meaningful to them. And the belief in occupational therapy is that the things that we do every day, be it mundane things you have to do like get dressed but all the way to fun things you do like socialize with people or do games and activities all of that has a, a therapeutic benefit you know if you take all of those things away when you stop engaging with other people if you stop cooking or baking or you know whatever it is you lose the abilities that are involved in that and just like you said a lot of times there's things with your hands or fine motor coordination or dexterity or social skills so it's really important to just keep doing what you love and important to note that in the lsvt big and lsvt loud protocols are not just exercises a lot of times that's what people think but we also do have um, people identify functional things that you want to be able to do that could be getting your wallet out of your pocket or it could be playing a game of chess you know how to move the pieces whatever that might be um, so we help to make sure that you understand how to use the programs to continue to do what you love to do so well good advice <laughs> for everyone <laughs> excellent all right I don't think do we have any other questions Laura that you notice I notice we're almost at time um, let me just see. I think just so many positive comments and comments of appreciation, Dr. Schmidt, for uh, sharing your story with us. And um, yes, I think yeah, I think yeah. that I think that we got most of them. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would just uh, like to also just express my appreciation to you. I'm smiling from ear to ear. Um, I was delighted you have brought me so much joy and hope and inspiration. And I know not just me, but all of our audience as well. Um, I know it's not always easy to share your personal story, but it's really, really impactful, whether it's a clinician that's listening, a person living with Louie, a caregiver, someone, a loved one. Um, I, I just really, really appreciate that. And thank you, Julia, too, for um, just sharing all of this with us and your insights as an occupational therapist. And like you said, our hope is to, um, you know, extend hope to people that are living with this diagnosis that um, there's, you know, a really wonderful quality of life still to be had. There's purpose and meaning sure. in your life every single day, um, no matter what the circumstances that we may face, you know, today or tomorrow. And uh, you've just shared that so well. Julia, I believe there's one last slide that we just want to pop up on the screen for everyone. If you wouldn't mind doing that, we want to make sure that everyone has contact information on how they can, how they can learn more. Um, so we put the contact information for the LBDA here, as well as LSVT Global. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, we'll be sure and get your questions to the right person. We will be sending an email in the next couple of days with 
some resources, some links for you that you can uh, learn more as well. But please feel free to reach out. We're really here for you no matter who you are or where you're from. Um, and just as a reminder, we will send an email with a survey link to it's very short, but it's very helpful uh, for us in program planning for the future, both from LSVT Global and from the LBDA. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, any last parting words, Julia and, and Dr. Schmidt, before we sign off for the day? I'll let Dr. Schmidt go first. I'm going to say, Laura, you 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 summarized it. Uh, there is life after diagnosis, uh, and uh, you may have to find that, but uh, uh, but it's there, and you can. There are things that you can do that will benefit yourself and benefit the people around you. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'll just add to that, someone asked, is FTD part of this disease? And no, that is a different type of dementia with a different type of um, pathology in the brain to it. So similar in some symptoms for sure, but very different disease. And I just wanted to add um, to Dr. Schmidt, you know, his story was one we do sometimes hear that people go for therapy and the therapists say they can't treat them because they won't you know make progress or things like that that's absolutely not true and i encourage you if you ever hear that from a therapist to go find another therapist so <laughs> be that advocate for yourself find that clinician just like you you know we wouldn't just walk away if a doctor said no we would keep trying to find another doctor sometimes you have to do that with clinicians as well to find the right fit exactly all right well, thank you all so much. Um, if you want to uh, share the Spark film with other people, you can go to mediflix.com. It's M-E-D-I-F-L-I-X.com. And uh, Jenny just put it in the chat here and just search for Spark and you can watch that movie again and again. I learn new things every time I watch it, just as you do, Dr. Schmidt. Um, exactly. Yes. Yes, and this is being recorded, this discussion and the introduction that Julia provided, and that will be posted in a couple of days on uh, LSVT Global's blog, which is blog.lsvtglobal.com, and search under webinars, you'll be able to find that. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone, and until we meet again, have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Schmidt. You're welcome. Thank you.